Hi there, my name is Dr. AJ Kumar, PhD. This is Abstract Algebra 11, and we are talking about signed areas of rational oriented polygons. And this is, there's going to be more about this, but th this is really the core of what I wanted to talk about regarding what is the determinant. That this is, this is what I've been leading up to. And then there's more we can talk about, but this is what I wanted to talk, this is what I wanted to get to. That's, this is what I've been leading up to this lecture. <clears throat> All right, so let's pretend we have two vectors u and v, and I'm going to define the symbol which in an S expression is the edge from u to v, e u v, and it's an oriented edge, and notice that it's not it's not translation invariant, so if you move this around it's a different edge. It depends on the endpoints, and, and really the data is the starting endpoint and the ending endpoint. That's that's the data contained in an edge, and it also has an orientation. So if I flip these two, it's a different edge. So we're going to define this function called sigma, which is the signed area of the edge, which sounds a little bit weird, but it'll make sense, as half of the determinant of u and v. Now what I want you to realize is that if we take the determinant what I mean by determinant uv is the determinant of the matrix uv, the matrix containing the columns u and v. So, right, sigma of the edge from u to v in this case is the determinant of, or is one half of the determinant of the matrix with these columns. I'm being sloppy with my notation, but what I mean is completely unambiguous and um, you can in fact write code that does this, and I have in the past, and then I, it's somewhere in the history of the QAnon repository. Um, I, I will bring it back at some point. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I want to think more carefully about the right way to do this. So anyway, uh, if you just take the determinant of the matrix UV, so the matrix whose columns are the column vector U and the column vector V, but I'm just going to be loose and call that the matrix UV. The determinant of that would be the area of the rectangle, and so half of that determinant is the sign, or would be the signed area of that oriented rectangle. So half of the determinant is the signed area of this triangle, if that makes sense. So sigma of EUV is the area of this oriented triangle, signed area, and so if we flip so the uh, sigma of EVU would be minus the area of that triangle. So when it's counterclockwise orientation, positive area, and when it's uh, clockwise orientation, negative signed area. Okay. So right, this is what I just said. Signed area of an edge is the signed area of the oriented triangle with the other vertex at the origin. So here are some examples. So here's an oriented edge, and uh, the signed area of this edge is negative because uh, the associated triangle has a counterclockwise orientation and it is just the signed area of this triangle. And now we see that if we have a ray, so if we have so if we have an edge that is that um, is what is it is on a ray or is on a line that goes through the origin, then the signed area of that edge is zero. Which, if you think about it, what it means is the column vectors are th are this endpoint and this endpoint, and so the image of that matrix is all linear combinations of these two column vectors, which is precisely this line. So, taking a times the f a times u plus b times v, you can only ever get a uh, uh, vector that is on this green line if you were to extend it in both directions. So that's another way to think about the matrix being invertible is if I ask what linear combination of you know the, this green point and this green point will give me this point, there is no linear combination. And then if I ask, well, what linear combination, or will give me that red point, what linear combination of this green point and this green point will give me here, well, there's infinitely many. So that's another way to interpret the matrix not being invertible. And when we talk about the inner product perspective on matrix multiplication, which is coming up, this will maybe be a little bit even more concrete. But anyway, over here we have a counterclockwise oriented triangle whose signed area is positive. Now note that this is cancellative. So 
if I take the right, if I take the signed area of the edge from u to v and the signed area of the edge from v to u and add them, I always get zero, and the reason is because they're negatives of each other. Okay. So an example, so as an example of how you use this to measure arbitrary polygons, well, the signed area of this polygon is the sum of the signed areas of the edges. Okay, so it's the signed area of the red plus the signed area of the green plus the signed area of the blue plus the signed area of the pink. And here are the column vectors. I didn't make any attempt to actually draw an accurate picture, but what matters is the endpoints. What matters are these vertices. So what we see is that this is three units wide, so we go from three to six and two units high. So if we go from two to four in the second coordinate. So three by two rectangle, this should have area six, and it's counterclockwise, so assigned orientation, assigned area of six. So let's just double check this. So what I want you to think about this is, is as chiseling off the counterclockwise parts. So the area, right, the area is equal to six, and if we measure just these two green ones, well, now we get two positively oriented triangles, and we take their area, minus these two triangles. And notice I flipped the orientation here because I put a minus sign here. So these two triangles that are over here have positive orientation, and so we're taking the green, the signed area of the green and red edges and subtracting the signed area of the blue and pink edges. In this case we would be adding them. You know what I mean. It, I think this picture is relatively clear. Just notice that over here I I flipped the orientation from this side to this side and that's because I put the minus sign here. So if I put a plus sign here it right you get what I mean. <clears throat> so let's calculate these signed areas of the edges. So the pink edge is goes from 3 2 to 6 2. So half of the determinant of that is half of 6 minus 12, that's the determinant of that matrix, which is minus 3. Half of the half of minus 6 is minus 3. Signed area of the red edge is half of the determinant of 6 6 2 4 because the red edge goes from 6 2 to 6 4. So the signed area of the red edge, uh, let me Right. The signed area of the red edge is half the determinant of 6, 6, 2, 4, which is half of 24 minus 12, which is 6. Signed area of the green edge is half of 6, 3, 4, 4, which is half of 24 minus 12, which is again 6. Um, <clears throat> signed area of the blue edge so this should be negative, and we're getting half of 3, 2, or half of the determinant of 3, 3, 4, 2, which is half of uh, 6 minus 12, so 6 minus 12, which is minus 3, and then the signed area of the spline is the sum, so minus 3 plus 6 plus 6 plus minus 3, that's 12 minus 6, which is 6. So this matches the area. So that's, that's, this is a, a nice way to de think about the determinant. So what I want you to do is at home just cook up some polygons um, with rational vertices and use whatever normal method you would use to calculate their area. So maybe make some triangles, some trapezoids, you know, um, pentagons, it doesn't matter. Make any shape where you can calculate its area normally, place it in the plane, and then use this method to calculate its signed area and make sure that it works out. Um, <clears throat> and then what I also want you to think about is, well, if, you, if I draw the curve of a function, I can use this to do approximate integration, right? I can just make a, uh, here, let me, let me just draw it. Um, I can, So here I'm going to draw some axes, and I'm going to draw a curve. That's a terrible curve. Is there a... Yeah. Ah, 
I don't know how to do this. Anyway, let me just draw a curve like this. Sorry, that's a bad curve. Now what I'm going to do is in blue, I'm going to draw a, an oriented spline. So we start at the origin, and we go over here. Okay, and these are two endpoints of integration. This is an edge. Go down here. This is an edge. Uh, and I'm just going to do a few points. Go over here. This is an edge. And I'm just using this to approximate the integral of this curve from this point. This is an edge. Up here, this is an edge. Go over here. This is an edge. Go over here. Here's an edge. Go over here. This is an edge. Go over here. This is an edge. And then finally circle back. Now you notice that uh, over here, we have a counterclockwise orientation, so we'll get a negative signed area down here, and over here we'll get a positive signed area because it's counterclockwise. And so I think this might untangle some of the knots that you might have in your head regarding um, integration, because you have this weird thing with integrals where you're not actually computing the area under a curve, you're computing a signed area, and you, you kind of just randomly introduce the sign, and we're it's sort of just hand waved off. Well, here's a really concrete way to think about the signed area. How do you even determine the sign, you know, computationally? Well, here you go. Um, so that might be a thing you can do is uh, dr draw a curve where you know something. Oh, you know what? That maybe that's something you can do is use, uh, you know, draw a curve where you know um, where you know some of its values and maybe you can compute its integral so you know y equals x squared or something like that and uh, try computing a signed area under the curve or signed area between the curve and zero um, that's a interesting idea and if you are interested more in this idea try Wildberger's algebraic calculus course I think it's largely based on this idea anyway um, Thank you. That's all I wanted to talk about for now. This this was the apex of what I wanted to talk about regarding the determinant. Is this interpretation of it as a way to measure things, as a way to measure areas? And actually, this works in three dimensions as well, which maybe I'll do in the next video. Instead of one half, you make it one sixth. And generally, um, in n dimensions, you do one over the number of dimensions factorial. And instead of edges, instead of the signed area of edges, you talk about the si signed volume of triangles. And then in four dimensions, you talk about the signed measure, which is the four-dimensional equivalent of volume, the signed measure of a tetrahedron. A tetrahedron is a three-dimensional shape. And then generally, you talk about the signed measure of a simplex. And um, it, it, maybe watch um, Wildberger's algebraic topology series if you want to see why a simplex can only have two possible orientations, and maybe I will talk about that. But this is kind of a an interesting way. Yeah, this this is this is a this is a way to think about the determinant, which is very simple, and that you can you know you can get to this point with a very straightforward path of reasoning if you start from what I was talking about with just linear systems of equations. It's a, pretty, it's a pretty straightforward sequence of logic to get here. And this is a really concrete, nice way to think about the determinant. And it's surprising that more people don't know about this. It's really nice. Anyway, that's all I wanted to talk about uh, for this video. I, there's a lot more directions we can go. Um, you know, I promised that we're going to talk about uh, projective geometry. I want to talk about the um, inner product perspective. Uh, the next chapter in Arden, and actually section 1.5, is an introduction to group theory. And that um, relates to what we were talking about here before, which was uh, the point I was making about mathematics being true and not being real. That was at the beginning here. Uh, the really abstract point that I wanted to make was that um, the really important part of a theory is what situations can it not tell the difference between. So my point was that linear algebra cannot tell the difference between, you know, 
this picture where counterclockwise is positive and clockwise is negative, and this picture where clockwise is positive and counterclockwise is negative, which are whatever. Or, and I can't tell the difference between this picture where we have right angled axes and this one where we have an affine plane rather than a Euclidean plane. Um, linear algebra cannot tell the difference between these two. Um, and 90% of the difference between any two, you know, subfields of mathematics between, you know, say topology and linear algebra, 90% of the difference is in what is its definition of equals, i.e., what, what situations can the tools of the theory not tell the difference between? So maybe, um, let me give you an example. So if you look up topology, um, Let's, uh, does it have the GIF? Yeah, here we go. This, this GIF. So the point is, topology cannot tell the difference between two shapes that are homeomorphic. Okay? The tools of, the topo of topology are not able to tell the difference between a donut and a coffee mug. Right? The tools of linear algebra are not able to tell the difference between this affine skewed plane and a nice Euclidean plane with right angles. Um, and so then maybe you ask the question, okay, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct some set of transformations that transforms, let's say, the Euclidean plane into this affine plane or moves this Euclidean plane over here to this reflected Euclidean plane over here. And my point is, is that linear algebra cannot tell the difference between those two situations, algebraically. Our visual, visually, if we look at a graph, we can tell the difference, but linear algebra alone cannot tell the difference between these two. Okay, so let's call that a symmetry of the theory of linear algebra. Linear algebra cannot tell the difference between these two situations. Topology cannot tell the difference between these two situations. And so, let, let's, uh, let me... This program is so unstable that I don't want to touch anything. But let's, uh, let's maybe have some rules. Have some rules. OK. Rules for uh, these symmetries. OK, number one, I can compose any two symmetries. So if I can't tell the difference between situation A and situation B, so you know, there's some A goes to B and I can't tell the situ difference between B and C, then I also can't tell the difference between A and C. Those are my rules. So I can compose them, and I get some new symmetry. Two, every symmetry is invertible, meaning if I can't tell the difference between A and B, then I also can't tell the difference between B and A. And a consequence of this is that there's a null symmetry, which is I can't tell the difference between any any situation and itself. Okay, these, these structures where th these are the rules for, let's call this a, um, a symmetry structure. Let's use that word. And it turns out in math that almost always the correct way to study anything is to study its symmetry structure. What are the situations that theory cannot tell the difference between? And the theory of symmetry structures, these symmetry structures, the rules that I just laid out here, these define what is called a group. And that is chapter two of Artin is group theory. Um, what situ group theory is the, is the theory of symmetry structures. And it's always best to study a theory or study any object by studying its, the structure of its symmetries. It's not always best, but that is how you gain the most insight, is by studying its symmetries. And group theory is the theory of symmetry structures. And it's a really rich theory of mathematics. It's beautiful. People will spend their entire careers researching group theory. It's a, there's a lot of open subjects. Um, there's a lot of open questions. There's a lot of unsolved problems. Um, this is, in a sense, the heart of pure mathematics is group theory.
Um, and it fundamentally comes from asking the question, what situations can I not tell the difference between? So here, here's an example with this signed area thing. Well, if I move this polygon, so this polygon, this oriented polygon, if I just, you know, if I drew it over here, you know, if I drew it over here instead of over here, then I would get the same signed area. So this uh, signed area of oriented splines is translation invariant. Translation means moving it from here to here, um, invariant. So maybe in order to study this, I would study the group of affine translations. Because any translation, I can invert it. There's a null translation. And if I compose two, you know, if I compose this translation with this translation, then I have a new translation just via vector addition. Um, and so there, that, that's, that's, um, that's the way to study things, is by studying what are its symmetries. Well, then also I have this thing where if I reverse the order of the points, then I get the negative. So that's almost a symmetry. Um, or maybe if I reverse the order of the points twice, then I'm invariant. So maybe that's a way to think about it. Um, or, you know, this, this, this thing where... Uh, this, this maybe is the proper way to express the symmetry, which is if I reverse the order and add the two signed areas together, I get zero. That's a symmetry. Um, anyway, um, the study of symmetry is what group theory is about. And symmetry is really the core of mathematics. Um, and it's also the core of physics, really. Um, the core of pure mathematics. Anyway, that's what I wanted to talk about today. That, this is where we're going. Um, right, so where we're going, we're studying projective geometry. Um, we're going to talk. I'm going to talk about projective geometry. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this uh, signed measure idea. Um, yeah, we'll talk about a few more things. Oh, the inner product perspective. Um, going to talk about polarity. Going to talk about talk about a lot of interesting things before we get to the next section of art. And, and I think, you know, I, I can talk about whatever I want. It's my channel. Anyway, thank you for, uh, thank you for watching. If you watched all the way through and listened to that rant, I uh, hope you have a nice day. I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.